Let me see, where are we? Oh yes, we're on our way from San Pedro Zula, going to Trujillo. Now, we have already left San Pedro on the train, down halfway to Puerto Cortes, off the train, onto little boats. These took us up the river and through a canal into another river. And then we got off at a place where we met the train, another banana train, as you remember, we have already said. We are on that train now. We're passing through the banana camps, which have given a little description about them. And I might say, as we went through these camps, we had the joy of passing out gospel tracts through the window. The people would come running, and that who could get the track? Of course, we tried to pass out as many tracks as there were people. They all ran back to their homes reading these tracks. And that was one of the first uh, stages in the work. So we went on and on, passing through more camps. Now we are coming up to Kilometer King, which we see now. We pass through Baracoa, Baracoa and then La Junta. Those are places where the trains met. We might have more to say about that in the future. But on we go. We're up to Kilometer Kingsay now. Now in Kilometer Kingsay, they have quite a camp there. They have uh, a factory there. Uh, there's the, have some are experimenting at this time with some uh, African palms, palmeras. They get a little nut of these palms, which they crush down and eventually make into oil. This oil is used for many purposes, making margarine, for instance making soap and other other things. So we pass by Kilometer Kingsley, that means to say we're fifteen kilometers from Tela. Now the train goes on and now we come to Kilometer Siete. Kilometer Siete is the farm where the United Fruit Company have their dairy farm. There they have hundreds of cows. There the milk is supplied for all their workers. And as well as that, they have other uh, things going on. But whoever will leave Kilometer City and in, at the moment, later on, we'll tell you about the wonderful times that we had there. Now we come on, now we're coming into Taylor Nuevo. Now Taylor, I might say, is divided in two. We have got what is called Taylor Nuevo and Taylor Viejo. Now, Tela Nueva, or other words in English, New Tela. That's where the company of their headquarters, or at least had when we went there first. All the bookkeeping and everything is taken care of in Tela. So at that time, they had quite a number of Americans living there. And uh, they had a port there, of course, where all the bananas came into in that lane. And uh, I might say 
that there was quite a place. Now, uh, Tela Viejo was connected with Tela Nuevo, although there was a river that ran between. However, they had a fairly good bridge over that river so that there was no difficulty in communicating with Tela Nuevo and Tela Viejo. Now, Tela Viejo was where those people lived who were not connected with the company nor with their work. Tela Nuevo had, had special houses for all those who were working for them. But in Tela Viejo, we had a different kind of people. There, there were those who lived by other means. Some of them, of course, were connected in some way with the bananas. But, however, most of them lived in other kinds of trades, which we will mention perhaps later on. And we'll tell you more about Tela Viejo in the future. But at the present time, that's where we left the train in Tela Nuevo. The train uh, went on, of course, to Tela Viejo, which was only five minutes further on. But we got off the train at Tela Nuevo, as we were there pretty early. We got in about four o'clock in the afternoon. That was from seven o'clock in the morning, 60 miles or so. Pretty good going. Well, you may think not, but if you had to have the experiences that we had in getting in sometimes at 10 o'clock at night, well, that for then you might begin to talk. But as we were pretty early, uh, we uh, had been advised by Don Alfredo to look up a man who lived there. Now, this man was connected with the company. In fact, he was an engineer on the railroad. He drove the train. In fact, the very train that we were on, he was driving. And as we went along, we had contacted him, and he had invited us to go to his home. Now, his home was supplied by the company, so he lived in a company home right in Tela Nuevo. He was about the only Christian that Don Alfredo knew. He had contacted him some time before, and this dear man had professed to be saved. But he did not know very much about him nor his life since that. But thank the Lord, he had been going on in a rather a godly way. And uh, we soon found out that he was much interested in spiritual things. So uh, when we left the train, he had directed us for to go to his home. It was not very nice. It was not very good. It was not very comfortable according to our standards. But however, it was a place that you could sleep in and a rest in and of course have some food in. So it was all right for us at the present moment. So we got to his home, and there we found his dear wife. He had a few children at that time, too. Rather small they were. And, of course, small children can make lots of noise. So we had plenty of entertainment that night. When he got home, he was able to give us more information. And uh, 
Of course, we were delighted to get that information. Now we found out that uh, to go on further, we had to take the train in the morning, the very next morning. And uh, to get that train, well, we had to get a walk up to Tela vehicle, which indeed wasn't very far. But we uh, got the train there in the morning on our way to La Saiba. And now this train did not go right into La Saiba. This was the United Fruit Company train. And it only went to a place called the uh, Hilama. And uh, that was the end of the United States territory. Then the Standard Fruit Company uh, had their place from their own. So uh, we were up in the morning about six o'clock and got the train and started off once more on our way to La Saiba now. But when we got to Helama, we had to get off the train there and transfer onto the standard train. Now, the standard train was a narrow gauge train. And uh, uh, we had always some fun in transferring as so many passengers were uh, traveling along to La Saiba and to Taylor, as the case may be. However, I might say that these were not really passenger trains. These were banana trains. And any passengers that had to make the trip, of course, well, they were taken along as long as the road along like bananas do. That isn't very comfortable at times, but however one gets used to it. There's no other way of traveling, so what can you do? You're glad to get where you want to go to, so you're satisfied to sit there in the tree. So, and may I explain too that the uh, these trains also carry provisions for the commissaries. That's the stores that the companies have to supply their workers and the camps with the food that's needed and the clothing that's needed and everything else. So they generally carry a good supply on these trains for each one of the commissaries. And it takes some time to uh, unload what they uh, need to leave and uh, the empties that they need to take back with them. For instance, they take the milk cans along for the different uh, banana cups. And then they take, uh, well, pop. Uh, that is. Uh, uh, down there, you know, the water isn't very good, and sometimes it's rather dangerous to drink much of it. In fact, you've gone, it's got to be very careful of the water situation. You can easily get diarrhea and dysentery and other, other illnesses by drinking the water that's not just perfect. And uh, where will you find perfect water? So even the people of the country themselves along the coast there drink more pop. That is Coca-Cola and Pepsi-Cola and uh, orange and lemonades and other fruit juices. And lots of those are consumed down there. So the train carries all kinds of goods that's needed in those camps. And uh, while the train waits, sometimes there was time for us to get off and go to the, visit the homes of the people and leave them gospel tracts. If there was no time, we just passed tracts out through the window 
He has thousands of tracks we use in those days, gospel tracks. And the people would come and run after the train as we threw them out through the window and try to get one and take that home and read it. And sometimes if your train was standing there, you would see them reading those gospel tracks. So, when we got to Elama, we changed over to the standard fruit train. And uh, uh, on we got, went on that train then, passing through the uh, standard fruit company camps, which were somewhat similar to the United Fruit Camps. So we went on through there, and... Uh, enjoyed ourselves as we went in our occupation of distributing these tracks through the window and also giving them to the passengers sitting in the, in the seats all around us. And he uh, we went uh, through all the train, of course, and passed out a track to each one, which they seemed to enjoy. That's one thing you very seldom found anyone who had turned down a gospel track. In fact, they seemed to be glad to get them. So on we went, and uh, of course the time was passing on too, and uh, we got nearer and nearer to La Saiba. At last we did reach La Saiba. Now La Saiba is quite a place. That is the standard fruit company's headquarters. They have got all their offices there, as we have described about the Taylor Railroad Company in Taylor. And they have got a big commerce area there. can buy all that's needed. And uh, our offices are there. And the only difference between La Saiba and Taylor is that uh, the two uh, citizen one, I mean where the company people live and where the people of the country live. They are all in La Saiba and uh, pretty near each other, although there are uh, certain quarters where they have the better class houses built for those who work in the offices and at that time uh, as a uh, uh, Taylor Railroad Company was, there were lots of Americans there. Of course, later on in years, those Americans left. The, uh, uh, those of the country were now more educated and able to take over. And as they were taken over then, more Americans uh, lost their jobs and had to return back home again which some of them, of course, were very happy to do. Now then, when we got to La Saiba, of course, we did not know of anyone there, although Brother Hawkins had told us of a man by the name of Salaya, and uh, we promised we'd try and look him up. Now, Salaya was quite a man. Uh, he had been saved years before in Guatemala. He had been in Port of Barrios, and there was a mission there while he was there having special meetings. And Salaya went one night to disturb the meetings and to uh, uh, have an argument with a preacher. And... Uh, try and shut his mouth. But instead of that, he somehow began to get interested in what the preacher was saying. And the Holy Spirit was working in his heart, convicting him of sin. He had been a rather wild character in his youth and as he grew up, and indeed he had been in some squabble with the authorities and everyone else. So he knew what he was, a sinner before God. And you know what? 
He accepted the Lord Jesus Christ that night and got really saved. Yes, he was really saved. Turned out to be a wonderful worker and a wonderful man for God. However, Donna Fred contacted him when he came over to Honduras. Donald Fred had the joy of baptizing him, he and his wife. And uh, then he left San Pedro Zula, and Donald Fred uh, had lost contact with him. But he had heard that he was living in La Saiba. So we promised we would look Salaya up, which we did. Of course, we had to go to a hotel that night, which was not very well, you wouldn't call it very nice, but however, it was suitable. So, we spent the night there, and the next morning we started off to see if we could find La Salaya. Eventually we did, after much inquiring, he was well known in certain quarters as he was quite a character. And uh, as he was so much uh, occupied in the past in Satan's things, now he was so much occupied in the Lord's things. And he was testifying to the saving power of God. And so many knew him in many ways. And the world at last we found where he was. He was very happy indeed to see us and to hear news of Don Alfredo and how the work was in La Saiba and San Pedro Zula. And pretty soon he had us sitting in his home and his dear wife, Doña Maria, had some good strong black coffee ready. And there were some frijoles, black beans, and rice, and tortillas. And we had a satisfying meal there. And uh, then, of course, we had been speaking to him about our mission and how that we were on our way to Trujillo and wanted to see the country. And, and uh, he was very helpful indeed gave us more information, and he put us up for the night. In fact, uh, he gave us, gave us a standing invitation. Why not come to La Saiba? Why not come and live here? And uh, he would try and do the very best for us, which he did at the moment. Although he had not much himself, he, it was always for the Lord, he said. Now his uh, principal living at that time was making confiti, that is candy. He made some candy out of sugar, melted the sugar down, put flavoring in it, and mixed it up. And Well, it was a very tasty little tidbit when he had finished with it. So he made uh, pounds upon pounds of that. And when he had about 50 pounds or 100 pounds weight, he would take that and go and sell it wholesale to the different stores. Then he would go to the villages around. And he would sell it to them. And they uh, give us much information about the people in the villages and, and what he was doing. And, we found that he was very much occupied for the Lord. And uh, he was very anxious that we should come and visit him often, if not to stay permanently there. So we had a wonderful time with him. And uh, then we had to uh, go on our way, of course, to Trujillo. So we said goodbye to him. Uh, but we'll have more to tell you about him in the future. Now, uh, the train next morning, the standard train, started off about 6 o'clock in the morning, and that would take us to our Guan River. And that was as far as the, as the uh, standard fruit company's train went. 
and uh, we had passed through our uh, camps as we uh, went on our way, of course, somewhat similar as we have explained. At last we came to Aguan River. Now, and that was the first time that we had been there, and we didn't know much about things, so we had to cross the river, and that river was uh, crossed by a little boat, and uh, uh, the little boat was very small, and you got in there, and you were pulled up the river a little ways, and then it uh, they let the boat come down with the current of the river. Eventually it made its way over to the far side. There in the far side you had to walk then about, oh, about 10 or 15 minutes up to, up to a little village. The moment I forget the name of that village, but I'll soon remember it. So, uh, we got across the river all right. I forget at the moment we had to pay what? About uh, 25 cents or something uh, to get across the river. And then uh, we had to, to look for someone to carry our, our grips then. So we did that. That was plenty of boys to do that. Although at some times there was some fun with them. You didn't make a contact with them, you would see that you were a gringo, as they call us, and a American, and, well, we had money. All Americans have money, of course. We, they didn't know the difference. They didn't know we were just poor missionaries. And the fact of the matter was we did not have very much money with us, very little indeed. Sometimes we were unable to pay what they wanted to pay. Then in that case, we had to carry our, the stuff ourselves. I may tell you more about that in the future. But however, on we went, and we got to this place, and I remember it was a Sunday. It seemed to me like uh, what, uh, the, uh, what the city of Vanity or something. It was uh, payday there. And Sunday was a big day there. And uh, the little village was just crowded with all kinds of people. The people from the camps all around had come in, and there they were selling and buying and everything else. And we made our way up, and uh, we uh, uh, had to get another train from there to take us to Trujillo. But uh, the, the train didn't, uh, there was no train on Sunday then. Uh, the train didn't, uh, it didn't run on Sunday. They took it off uh, after payday uh, because there was too much killings. There was too much uh, rioting and rather dangerous. So at last they took the train off on the Sundays after the payday, or whatever payday was that took the train off, because the people, until they'd spent their money, weren't in any way uh, associable. So uh, we found ourselves amongst those people at that time. And ever, however, we found a place where we could sleep. It was a little hotel that was there. The man of the hotel was very nice indeed to us, and he made us as comfortable as comfortable could be. So we had to spend the whole evening there and wait till the next day. Now, uh, they found out uh, the village itself and had a little walk around and distributed gospel tracts there many times in the in future, we had the privilege of doing the same thing. But uh, early in the morning, Monday morning, the train came along, and uh, it came from Trujillo and was going to Olanchito. 
And then after that, I was going to turn and come back and go back to Taylor again. Uh, well, we came along and well, we thought we'd get on the train and go to Olanchito and see what Olanchito was like. So we did. We got on that train and off we went. And, and uh, uh, very fortunately in that train we found the conductor was an American. And uh, he was very friendly very helpful to us in every way and he told us about Olanchito and uh, he told us that uh, they uh, spent the night there and then the next morning we came so we had to spend the night in Olanchito too so he told us where we could find a fairly well a fairly good hotel he said and we found that hotel and we went there. Let me see, we got there about, um, oh, there about 12 o'clock, was it, or somewhere. And walked around Olanchito and found something interesting there. And, uh, well, uh, we had the intention of returning sometime to see it again, which indeed we did. What a wonderful work commenced there later on and the next day then we were on our way again out to Trujillo passing by uh, uh, this place that uh, let me see I can't remember the name I think it was a Guan they called it if I'm not mistaken a Guan a Guan River it was that passed by and I believe the name of this place was a Guan I may remember the future. However, on we went then, visiting, passing more banana camps, banana camps, more banana camps, all the way. There was nothing but bananas, bananas, bananas. Everywhere you looked, those bananas. And uh, we passed through many of these and uh, passed the tracks as we went along, of course. Then on we went then until we came to, let me see, oh well, I forget the name of the place, but uh, however, it was a kind of a junction. And there, uh, there was a, a, a siding that went out to Seco. Now Seco was away next to Mosquito District. And, uh, uh, of course, we went right on then until we came to Puerto Castillo. Now, uh, Puerto Castillo was the head place for the railroad, uh, the Trujillo Railroad Company. Now, Trujillo Railroad Company was part of the United Fruit Company. Only it was called the Trujillo Railroad Company. That's where they had their headquarters. That's what they, where they had their head offices. And it was quite a place, this. They had uh, better buildings here. They had um, cement and brick buildings. And uh, uh, everything seemed to be very nice indeed. And they had a big hospital there, too. A very good hospital it was. And there they had quite a school for, for the children of the Americans. At that time, lots of Americans were living there. Although they didn't like it, it wasn't very healthful. But they had their places fixed up uh, to be as comfortable as possible. They had a big commissary there. Could buy everything that was necessary that was needed in that part of the world. So, uh, however, we were going on to Trujillo. So that same train was going on to Trujillo, which it did. Now, Trujillo, you have to come back on your track a little way. Uh, and where there's another junction that 
went on to a lanchita, but instead of going to the lanchita, we turned to the right, which took us to to uh, Trujillo. Now Trujillo was right across the bay from Fort Castilla, and uh, uh, you had a nice view as you went along. So we eventually passed on and went to Jericho. Now Jericho was the place where they had their farm. That's where they, they had their cows and where they got the milk for their people and, and everything else, and meat and all like that. So we passed through Jericho and on then until we came to Trujillo. Now uh, uh, Trujillo was along right on the on the uh, water's edge, of course. So we got off the train there, we're at the journey's end, and we inquired where we could find a, a hotel there, which we did. And uh, we spent the night in the hotel there under such the same conditions as being in any other place. And the next morning then, we uh, were up bright and early to have a view of Trujillo to see what it was like. By the way, we got in about six o'clock, I think it was, that same uh, the night before. And uh, uh, that wasn't so very far from La Saiba, but down there you must understand uh, you go by hours. You go by instead of uh, how far is it? You said so many hours to that place. It may only be 10 miles away, but you say, oh, it's 15 hours to a journey. Uh, that's the way you have to do it down there. Not so much by mileage, but more by more by hours. So we were in Trujillo now, and uh, uh, we were in Trujillo has two or three parts. It has what they call Rio Negro, Black River, and that's the part down below, right down on the sea. And then uh, you go up there and you get into Trujillo proper. Now, Trujillo is quite a place. That was where Colum uh, Columbus first landed uh, as on the mainland when he came over and discovered the land first of all. Of course, he landed first of all in an island by the name of Salvador. But this is a mainland. This is when he, when he first stepped off the soil of the boat onto the mainland soil. And uh, it's one of the oldest places on the continent. When he got there, of course, he put up some buildings and the old church that's there, the year 19, 1502 is marked on the top of it. But the year 1400 and something is down below. Uh, that's when he landed there. And the church was completed in 1502. The Roman Catholic Church, of course. They had some of their old ruins of the buildings are still there yet. And some very nice work they had done. And of course, some of it is uh, down now. The fort is still there. It's still in use. And, uh, they have the old cannons there. Uh, quite a few of them, and it's quite a a scene to see the 21 shots going off when some dignitary comes along and have to give them a salute and uh, watch those men work and get in there, uh, well, everything they put in, and the old rags and bags and uh, straw and grass and everything to pack in before they let it off. And, well, I don't know how long it takes to let off 21 
volume, volumes, but it takes quite a while. And uh, the men work pretty hard while they're doing that, of course. That's the headquarters for the that part of the country. And uh, quite an uh, army barracks there, and they keep the soldiers there. And uh, the commander-in-chief, uh, that's where he lives there. And we'll tell you more about him in the future. We had a lot to do with him in the days to come. However, we visited around and a very nice park to have there. And uh, it was uh, rather, um, well, interesting to sit at night and see the young people out in the park the boys walking in one direction and the young ladies walking in another direction uh, with uh, those who are uh, guarding them along with them and taking care of them. It was rather interesting to see those things and they had a, quite a band out there too. But however, that day we, we met an American and it was, uh, happened to be a doctor and he lived right in the center of the town. And he had been living there for some time. He was living alone. Now it appears that he has his home in the United States. And one thing we found about him was this. He couldn't live well in the United States for one strange reason. Now that reason was at that time for, uh, Prohibition was in the States, and he, he, he couldn't uh, find uh, uh, that which he needed to live. That was uh, a few tragos, as they used to say. That's a little strong drink, I mean, whiskey, things like that. It was impossible, he said, to find that in the States without running great risks and paying big money for it. Well, there was no, uh, had, uh, no obstacle of that in Trujillo. He could find that all the time, all and pretty cheap and everything else. So that was the reason he told us that he was uh, living there. And he was practicing medicine there. And um, he was seemed to be a pretty straight man, pretty clean man, and otherwise only for that one, uh, one uh, uh, drawback in his life that he couldn't live without liquor. However, he invited us up to his home. He had plenty of room, he said, and indeed he so he had. We uh, uh, came up and told us to bring our baggage with us and stay there a few days with him. This we were very happy to do, so that we could, uh, well, uh, spend a little time there and see what things were like, and inquire about other things too. So that we did, and we were able to make ourselves at home with him, and we were able then to find something to eat and, and another place to have for eating in. And, uh, well, we made ourselves pretty comfortable there for a few days, and I walked around the place and passed out the gospel tracts to the people and found they were very friendly and, and everything, and we found that Trujillo in some ways was a little cooler, just a little cooler in many ways than other places. And in fact, there was a little breeze that was blowing every day, which happened to cool things down. I think that's uh, what the difference was. However, we uh, started to inquire about the Mosquito District and how we could get to it. As we were told it was from Trujillo that you could get to the Mosquito District. And, uh, well, we found a very interesting gentleman down in the railroad office. He was an American, too, and uh, he was able to give us more information than anyone else. Yes, he says, you can get to the Mosquito District from here. 
He told us the best way that we could go. There's two ways, but the best we could go was if possible to go by boat. Get a boat that was going up in that direction somehow. If not, we could go to by train. Take this train to to Seco, but that was the end of the line. We got off the train and we'd have to make our own arrangements there, and have someone to carry our baggage, have a guide to take us, and all the rest of it, which uh, of course we'd have to do and find out ourselves when we got to Seco. And it was rather difficult that, of course. But however, we found out lots of things and then we got into contact then with, uh, with uh, those who uh, uh, knew something more about the boats. In fact, we found one man who owned a boat. And uh, he told us that his boat went up there once in a while. They'd be very happy to take me up any time I wanted to go that they were going. Well, we weren't just ready for that at the present time. The big thing at the moment was making the trip to Trujillo and seeing what Trujillo was like. And so, uh, however, I thought that that was uh, pretty good, that uh, we would try and make that trip sometime in the future. But I had seen enough of the land to let us know understand that there was great need there. That's where there was need. There was no one working anywhere in any place that we had passed through. Not since we left San Pedro Zula. On we came to uh, Telan, and then to La Saiba. Now on through Olanchito. On now to Trujillo.